You know what? I'm working through my 28th year of preaching. And um, I, I'm, I'm serious when I tell you that this particular study from Corinthians has been the toughest series that I've ever undertaken. Really has. Um, but I will say this. Um, you as a congregation have been a great encouragement to me throughout the sharing of, of this particular series of lessons. You know, the thing is, the Apostle Paul, man, he, um, he didn't always say things we like to hear, does he? And um, I think that would have been true for the Corinthian church, and it's probably true for all of us, even at Waters Road. Don't I look handsome? <laughs> zoom in on that, will you, uh, Billy? Zoom in on that. Sweet young lady. Yeah, they did a good job. I mean, that's a that's a portrait. One of our guests this morning, young lady, drew that, gave it to me. I'm going to frame it. It's the best drawing of me I've ever seen. All right, Ephesians 5, 22. First of all, I want to say thank you to both Guy for the sermon last Sunday morning. Those of you that were able to be with us enjoyed a great sermon. And how many of you were here for Bible class last Sunday morning with Brother Todd? I mean, folks, that was incredibly well done. His knowledge and understanding of both Scripture and the Roman times, and uh, just incredible. So I just want to say thank you to uh, both of them for sharing the messages they did last Sunday morning. But we're going to pick back up. What we're going to do, if you've got your books, it's basically going to be a combination of chapter 9 and chapter 10, because chapter 9... Uh, talks about wives, does it not? And then chapter 10 deals with the husband. But because I wasn't able to be with you last week, um, I've combined the two into really one full lesson. So we're going to go from 522 through 69. We can just skip the husband and work on <laughs> Okay, well, that's, we can do, do the wives a second week. You, are you saying that the wives need more work than the husbands? I'm saying that. Okay. I'm not saying that either. I'm going to get a beating when I get home. That's okay. We all, it all happens to us all. The truth is, we're nearing the end of our study here, Ephesians. We've got 11, 12, and 13, and then uh, we will change up things for the next quarter. But... Um, over the last several weeks, we have seen how the world that we live in is toxic to the development of Christian virtue. And if we're going to make it, we've got to spiritually fight, as they were used to say, tooth and nail. Um, and we feel like sometimes we're literally swimming upstream against the current of our culture. But at the end of chapter 5, Paul gives us another very important principle for spiritual growth. And to me, it's so fascinating. Something that could change your life because it is something that God has placed within many of our lives 24-7 to teach us about himself. And the fact is, most of us don't even realize that it's there. And that is our relationships. Paul takes three very common relationships. Mm -hmm. Marriage, family, and work and explains that these relationships are very much like laboratories that God has set up within our lives 
to mold us and make us more like his son, Jesus Christ. Um, I, I've, I've preached in some churches that had doctors. I know at Waters Road we have nurses or people in the medical fields. And sometimes we hear uh, in certain situations that certain medicines are developed in a laboratory. And these laboratories work on these various medicines until they get them right. And then you watch the commercial, right, Mary? And the commercial lists like 20 side effects that none of us want. I mean, all of us have seen that. Yeah. But the truth is, when God brings us into his laboratory, and he finishes us eventually, we're a perfect peace because Jesus Christ has made us perfect. But one of the things we best not forget is that God uses relationships to make us his masterpiece. So let me first review a couple of very important principles that I feel like are let's see. <laughs> Very important truths that we've already learned here from Ephesians. Let's go back to Ephesians 1 and verse 12. I need a volunteer to read Ephesians 1 verse 12. And as you're reading that verse, I want you to think about this question. What is God's main purpose for us? What is God's desire for us? Ultimately, what does he want from us? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 12. Somebody read that for us, please. That we should be to the praise of his glory. Who first trusted in Christ. All right, let me make sure I'm giving you the right one. I think we may have to go another verse there. All right, that's, that's, that's why I should have given you 11 and 12. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So the very first thing that Paul points out, God's primary purpose in salvation was to make us into people who would bring God what? What does that verse say that we should bring Him? Glory. Glory. Okay? And we do that by becoming more and more like whom? Like Christ. We should imitate Him. We should resemble Him. We would be in every way His sons and daughters... Loving what Jesus loved, right? And reacting like he reacted. There is this big word that we see in the book of Romans. It's that S word is called sanctification. Sanctification. Man, that's a really big religious sounding word for a lot of people. But all it really means is making you like Jesus Christ. Second, we've learned in Ephesians that God is a sovereign God. Which means how much, how much church is outside of God's control? <coughs> Nothing. <coughs> And he uses all things in our lives for that very purpose. You saw that in verse 11. Then Ephesians 1 verse 11, what did it say? He uses all things according to the purpose. Him works all things according to the counsel of his what? Will. Now in chapters 5 and 6, let's get back over to chapter 5. He's going to take those two truths 
and he's going to put them into the practical elements of our relationships. And that shows me something incredibly fascinating. It really does. That in the most basic of human relationships, do not forget this fact that even in the most basic human relationships, God's sovereignty is still at work. Think about that. All the relationships that you've had in this life, that God is like a scientist in the laboratory using those relationships through His sovereign will to make you into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. Do you want to write anything down? Well, let me give you something to write down if you want something to write down. God uses our relationships to teach us about himself and make us like himself. All right, let's look into the first one. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22 I want to read 22, 23, 24 first. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit in everything to their husbands. Do we just stop there? Jerry, do, do we just stop there? Oh, no. No. I'm trying to help you out, Jerry. I'm digging a deep hole. I'm okay. afraid. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. By the way, this next verse refers all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. Therefore a man shall what? Leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then Paul gives this, and I've got this highlighted in my study Bible. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to what? Christ and the church. Listen to me. If you don't remember anything I tell you from this particular lesson, I hope that you will remember this. God gave us marriage to teach us about his love for us. I said it a couple of weeks ago. I've, I have learned a great amount in Bible classes about God's love for me. but I've truly experienced it in the gift of marriage. Are there, are there times it's hard to love your husband? Yes. <laughs> I know that Jennifer's watching because she's already sent me a text message. <laughs> she's coming back from Ohio on a plane. Are there times where it is possibly hard for her to love Jonathan Sanford? Yeah. Husbands, is it always easy to love your wife? The truth is, it has taught me a lot about grace. Let me give you three ways this morning, and let's start with the most fun way, and then we'll work our way to the not-so-fun stuff, um, the painful Let's look at three ways that God reveals his love for us and his desire for us to be like his son in marriage. Let's look at three ways. Number one, in the delights of marriage, we get a taste of the beauty of God. How many of you have heard of C.S. Lewis? Raise your hand. I want to share with you a quote. This is about... 50-something years ago. He was talking about marriage 
and he called it a ray of sunshine. By the way, he was only really repeating what another man had said some 300 years ago who said, marriage is the ray, God's love is the sun, marriage is the symbol, God's love is the reality, marriage is the stream, God's love is the ocean. In other words, marriage is a very tangible way to experience the love of God and to see the beauty of God. Let me tell you a, a quick example for me personally. The day I got married and my wife was walking down that aisle, I was doing really good. And I, when they opened the doors at the back of the church and she came through those doors and I saw her for the first time in her wedding dress, I couldn't help it. I started crying. Now, why was I crying? Was I crying because, man, she's so ugly. Oh, she's not watching. She is. Was I crying because, oh, man, look how... No, I was crying because she's so beautiful. It wasn't a sad cry. It was a joyful cry. <laughs> how many of you ladies in the room have ever cried at a wedding? And you weren't even, you weren't the one in the wedding. You were at the wedding, but you weren't the one getting, how many of you ladies have ever cried at a wedding? How many of you ladies have ever cried watching a TV show about a wedding? <laughs> Guys, it's okay if it happens to you as well. You may not have known it at the moment. I may not have known it that, that day, but in that moment, what you were experiencing is God expressing his beauty to you. That's something to really think about. Marriage pictures a love that we were created for. It is a love where two human beings, two separate souls, according to Scripture, two individuals become what? One. <laughs> There's a fusion, an intimacy between the two. It's ex exclusive, is it not? You are exclusively mine and I am exclusively yours. And in that, let me tell you what, I've, I, over years of doing marital counseling with people, the closest you'll ever get to understanding godly jealousy is in marriage. The closest. Unconditional. <coughs> Everyone who is born has a desire to be known and loved. But to be known but not loved, that's a dilemma. We need both. You see, I know that not everybody is going to want to love me. Some of us are like porcupines. Porcupine is a dilemma. Because you mess with a porcupine the wrong way, what's going to happen? Going to get quills in you, right? Now, I'm just going to go a little bit different route here for just a moment. How many of you know what it's like? Uh, how many of you ever had your wife or your husband put their cold feet on you in the middle of the night? <laughs> how many of you are people who, when you try to go to sleep, you've got to have somebody right up against you? And how many of you are people who got to have separation? Now, if, if you marry somebody that loves, I think they used to call it back in the 50s, they call it spooning, is that right? Yeah. If you married somebody that likes that cuddling at, at night, and you like that cuddling, guess what? You're in good situation. 
But if you marry somebody like me, that's got to have his little spot in the bed with nobody touching me, and you want to cuddle, then it's going to be an issue. I'm the porcupine. Because you touch me, I'm, hey, what are you doing? You think I'm trying to take the basketball away. Yeah. Very important. What do I mean by that? You can you can let marriage teach you about God's love, but listen, I don't want you to misunderstand me this morning. This is very important, but you cannot let marriage replace God's love in your life. When that happens, you start to look at the ray of sunshine as if it's the sun itself. Secondly, in the roles of marriage, we get a picture of the image of God. Now, what I'm about to tell you is pretty deep. You turn to Genesis in your Bible, and you see that this man is created in the image of God, and Eve is taken from man's side also in the image of God, but differently. Right? And this is what Paul is saying right here in the passage that we've read this morning. When God looked at man and said, Well, it's not good for man to be alone. He didn't fix it. Listen to me. He didn't fix it by creating somebody that looked just like him. He didn't just create another man, did he not? He created a female. And each is created differently to reveal, and I've said this a few weeks ago, a complementary aspect of the image of God. And if you ever want to truly see the image of God more clearly, you see it when the male and the female are one, the way that God desired it. Verse 23 says the husband plays the role of what of the wife? What does it say? The head. Like Christ is the head of the what? Church. And is himself its savior. Which means he is to lead her like God leads his people and in leading her, she gets to experience a aspect of God's leadership. And you and I as men get to experience what it's like to love and lead like God. You know, when you study the book of Genesis, I see four ways that we as men are to be leaders. The first is in provision. The second is in spirituality. The third is in romance. And the fourth is in sacrifice. And if you are a man this morning and you're not willing to lead in your marriage in provision and spirituality and in romance and in sacrifice, you're going to let down your, your wife. You may be good at one You may be a great provider. You may work 70 hours a week and pay all the bills and everything is great. But if you're not leading your wife spiritually, you are letting her down. She's never going to truly see God's leadership in your marriage unless she sees you leading her spiritually. Same way in sacrifice. By the way, sometimes men, we're very selfish, are we not? We want our toys, and we're not often willing to sacrifice them. I think in Ephesians especially, you see that a man is willing to lead not in a domineering fashion. You remember the old show, and I forget the name of it, when he would always say, one of these days, 
All in the family. Gleason. Gleason. Jackie. Is it Jackie Gleason? Oh, it's I thought it was another one. Honeymooners. Honeymooners. Okay. Yeah. That's not the, the image that God wants us to see of marriage. Okay. The kind of leadership that a husband should have is the same that Jesus had. I come not to be served, but to serve. You know, I have a real burden, a real compelling, like Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians, I have a real compelling in my life to try to improve those four aspects of my life and my marriage. And any of you other men in this room, I think you, if you're honest, you can see too that there are, there are challenges in being those four things at one time. We're pretty one-track minded at times, and so we may be really good about provision, really into romance, or what we think is romance. We may really be good at, at, at sacrifice, or even really good spiritually as a leader, but it requires all four. All right, I did the husband thing first because I figured I was trying to help you out. Now, what about the wife? What is your role? You are to play the role of the church. You go, wait a second, that doesn't sound right. How is the woman like the church? Y'all ready for this? I need some encouragement here. Verse 24. Somebody read that for us one more time. Now, if the church submits to Christ, then also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. All right, so Paul says the wife is like the church in that she does what? <laughs> Submits. You're like, no, no, Jonathan, you didn't just say that. <laughs> I, I didn't say that. Apostle Paul said that, right? <clears throat> Which means what? She surrenders... Her ambitions to his? I mean, look how verse 23, it says that man is the what? Head of the body. Head of the wife. So, in this case, then that would mean that the wife ceases to have the desire to build her own kingdom. That she is ready to be a part of whose kingdom? The husband's kingdom. Okay? Just like we're not out here trying to build our own spiritual kingdom, are we? We want to be a part of whose kingdom? Christ, because he's the head over the body, right? By the way, let me say this. The Bible is not against women in careers. I know that was taught years ago that a woman's place was just to be at home, and that was where God wanted her, was just to be at home. But um, I, I, that's just not, that's just not true. But if you're married to a non-Christian, it's harder to submit. Yep. It, there, there are certain challenges, and I can tell you from my mother, even though my dad was a Christian, he was an unfaithful Christian for many years, I, 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 see, I saw those challenges that she faced in submitting to him in those, those times. There were times where he would say, I want you to stay home from church and do this. I was married to a man, Christian. He became a Christian. But uh, when we first married, there was things I didn't want to submit to him. Yeah. Like going to church, for example. Yeah. Uh, he used to want me to stay home and not go to church. Yeah, that's the way my mom faced. Yeah. Should, should a wife submit to an ungodly man? In the general principles of marriage, absolutely. But not in those things that would contradict spiritual leadership. It kind of goes on to say that in some ways, women have led their men to Christ by living that way. That's exactly. And you know what, Mike? 
the week that my dad died, all of my mom's work paid off in that respect. All those years of being submissive and being a consistent example of Jesus Christ within our home. I mean, it drove me crazy. There were mornings I would think, man, my mom is just out of her mind. I'd be kicking this guy to the curb. You know what I mean? Just, I'd, I, I said this a couple, I said, mom, if you'll let me, I'll go up and get us a newspaper and we'll find us a, a new house and we'll go and live in that. She'd say, no, you're not. She was going to keep on living Christ-like before my father and, I know that that paid off. That flows right into your sermon, really. Yep. Yeah, because she didn't compromise the word. That's the key. She shared the message. She never compromised the message. She had to adapt, I'm certain. But she never compromised the message. She never compromised who God had called her to be at any point in time. And I'm sure I'll be the same applies to you. She eventually became a Christian and was a deacon here. Wonderful. For years. Even if she had not lived, she still would have been rewarded. Yes. I, I thank you for saying that, Miss Sue. You're exactly right. <laughs> yes. Okay. You said trust is for the minute in his life. Yes. So turn it around a doubtful life should be in. Both ways. That's right. Right or wrong? Well, not wrong. Not wrong. Anything contrary to God's will, that's a different situation. Just like we are submit to the government, right? Does the Bible not say we're submit to our ruling authorities? Yes. But if our ruling authorities tell us to do something that's contrary to God's will, do we go ahead and do it? No. What did Jesus say? Grab the coins, render under Caesar's. Render under Caesar's. What is Caesar's? That's exactly right. The third thing, real quickly, because I know we're out of time, but I think one of the biggest things for me, and this is probably the most painful part, um, in forgiveness. By the way, is forgiveness a requirement in marriage? Yes. Yeah. And this is what I really meant by I've experienced it. In forgiveness... In marriage, we get a taste of the grace of God, do we not? Man, there is an awful stiff learning curve when it comes to marriage. How many of you have found marriage to be difficult in one fashion or another? How many of you remember when you started out, when you first got married, thinking, this is going to be so easy, <laughs> only to go wake up one morning and go, this is actually pretty hard. You never stop actually learning. No. Because life keeps putting things in your path and you deal with uh, different things. And in the marriage, you know, you have to come together and agree on things. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, Jerry, I have done marriage counseling with pe premarital counseling with people that thought they were marrying the perfect husband, oh, yeah. the perfect wife. And then... Six weeks into the marriage, thought, well, I surely didn't. I, that wasn't the, that, that, he was pulling the wool over my eyes, or she was. But I try to help people to see before they ever say I do that the person that you are marrying is not perfect. A lot of people get disappointed, and then they divorce <clears throat> because we don't understand that the people we are marrying are just as flawed as, as we are. All right, well, I could keep going because i got a lot more here. Maybe, I don't know, we'll see for next Sunday what I do, but um, i got a lot more material here that I meant to cover. Thank you so much for being with us this morning, especially for our worship and our Bible class today. Thank you to all of our guests who've been with us today. If we can help you out in any way, please let us know how we can serve you. Hope you have a great afternoon. Don't forget to be back at 6 p.m. tonight for our evening worship if you're able to join us for that. We're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2 tonight. Thank you, and, and let's uh, end with a prayer quickly. Father, again, we thank you for this class and for everyone who are members of it, especially for our guests this day. And just pray, Father, as we've studied this word from Ephesians, especially looking at, at marriage and the reflection of our relationship to you and the beauty 
of you, our Heavenly Father, and the grace. Um, Father, just pray that we might be reflecting upon these things in our own marriages. Father, whether we're uh, in the middle of our marriage or maybe our spouse um, has departed from this life and is no longer with us, but still let us look back on those moments and realize the beauty and the grace and the reflection and the, the way those relationships have made us more like your son, Jesus. Thank you for your grace and for your forgiveness. I ask you to keep us safe here the rest of this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you all. Love you very much.